What's up, everybody? Thank you tuning in. Crypto Street Podcast. This is Dale coming to you live from cold ass Iowa in my mom's basement. Moved in last week because it's cold in my house. No, just kidding. Um, you're tuning in. Crypto Street Podcast. Like I said, we've got a pretty bombing guest tonight. We're we're excited. We'll get to that here in a little bit. But as always, um, Prince is doing hockey Canada thing, so he is unable to join us tonight. So Killer and I will be holding. Holding the fort down, Killer. What's good tonight, buddy? It's good, man. It's uh, it's good to be back. I had to miss last episode, but um, I I listened to it. I very much enjoyed it. It's good to be back here. Um, this week getting uh back into the flow after Thanksgiving break is a little bit challenging, but uh, we're working our way through. We're almost at Friday, so we've got that uh, week long Thanksgiving hangover, which is oh which yeah, is brutal. Um, we were talking about it before. Ed joined us on this hangout, how brutal the Thanksgiving hangover is. Um, just tired all the time. Not any fun, but you know what? We're going to fight through and it. Like, and when you have like a like an actual job, it's like you get more time off for Thanksgiving, actually, than almost any other holiday. And it's like it's very yeah. bizarre to not go in for like, you know, almost like a week. It's just yeah. it's a very foreign thing. Yeah. And if you know, if these markets would turn around, we could ha have a. 365 days off technically even though i bet you yeah. i just have a feeling if if we were ever full-time crypto that uh i'd probably work more doing that than than my job right now but hey you know what maybe yeah we don't uh we aren't gonna judge we're, we're, this is a judge-free podcast so let's uh no one really cares to hear about our thanksgiving hangover let's just get into our incredible guest um he is the ceo and co-founder of blockfolio he also is a founding board member of the Dash Foundation. Pretty pumped to have him on, Ed Munkata. He's going to kind of go through some stuff with us tonight. So, Ed, thank you very much for taking the time with us to join. It's uh, it's We're really pumped to have you on. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, thanks so much for asking me to, to be on your podcast. Yeah, so before we kind of dive into Blockfolio, you know, what it's like sitting on the the Dash Foundation board. Let's kind of just give everyone listening a brief overview of of how you got into crypto, what it was that um, you know sparked your interest to yeah. get into it. Yeah. So a little bit of background with me before I even got into crypto, from like 2001 to about 2010, I was playing poker professionally. So uh, in 2000, late 2012, I was aware of Bitcoin. My friend had started an online Bitcoin poker site uh, called Seals with Clubs. I kept seeing this post on Facebook about it. And then uh, in early 2013, I was like, you know what, let me, let me buy one of these Bitcoin things and, uh, <laughs> and stick it and uh, let me see what I can do. I want to play on your site. And so, uh, uh, you know, just given my background in poker, I, you know, it, it was, you know, I was a pretty strong professional poker player. But what was pretty amazing to me is the site had like a lot of recreational players because I think still back at that time, you know, People who had a lot of Bitcoin to burn were these guys that like invested early on, and mm -hmm. a lot of professional poker players weren't even aware of it yet. So in the site, it was an exceptionally uh, easy poker game. So over the course of three months, I turned a Bitcoin into 150 Bitcoins, and uh, and I sold I think I sold 100 Bitcoins. It was about ten thousand dollars at the time, and then it took 48 hours to hit my Chase account. And anybody who's like familiar with with online poker knows that like. Uh, 2006 the u.s government like tried to like uh basically halt all online gambling it was and crazy it it, i played on it, full tilt yeah they made it really difficult to move money in and out of uh gambling sites right so when i when i it normally would take like two weeks to cash out of a poker site and you get some like weird check from an llc in the middle east right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so when i saw when when this when 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 the cash got you know went from my coinbase to my my Chase account in 48 hours, that was when the light bulb went off. I was like, wow, I just touched something really interesting, like this nascent yep. technology that nobody knows about is circumventing like, you know, US government efforts, uh, um, you know, to control their money, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, and so and I went down like the wormhole that everybody goes through, I think, in the beginning of like the, in their introduction to crypto. I spent the next three months just reading everything about, you know, decentralized attributes of it. Um, you know, and uh, realizing that to us, you know, something that seemed like so risky uh, in other countries, uh, you know, this wasn't risky because it was decentralized. Uh, it would um, 
felt like it would essentially take like collusion between all governments to shut this thing down, be as hard as shutting down torrent networks. Right. So, uh, so I was like, wow, I was like, you know, this, this thing, uh, I could see a lot of, uh, really poor people like seeing Bitcoin as a, uh, as, as a haven. And I felt like there was a floor that was going to be there, uh, on demand. And, uh, and there are a lot of other things that, you know, I looked into about it, but that, at a certain point I just realized, I was like, wow, I really want to get into this. I want to invest in it. I want to start understanding how blockchains can impact society. Uh, and next that's, I guess the sort of long version of how I got into crypto real quick, Ed, I don't, I think you're selling yourself short a little bit here. Don't you have a bracelet from a world series of poker? I do. <laughs> so that, that needs to be, that. <laughs> yeah, that needs to be noted for the record. Cause I don't want you to sell your poker career short. Um, also back on the payment thing. It's kind of funny you say that I won, I was, I played on full tilt and poker stars when I was in college, but, um, so it's funny you say that I, I had one, uh, I got third place in a tournament for a, a good chunk of change. And my mom works at the bank where I, where I banked at the time. And she called and she's just like, what is this deposit from, you know, she's like golf balls, limited LLC for you know, <laughs> right? a couple thousand dollars. And I was just like, Oh, I have no idea. So she about <laughs> sent it back because she's like, well, if you don't know what this deposit is for, it should not be hitting your account. So right. it's just kind of funny. So, yeah, I mean, and and so, yeah, I think I think it was funny because I think a lot of poker players came into crypto early on because they they were I think they, you know, they were so familiar with like the restrictions that, that the government had placed on this, and they were all kind of like I think went through the same experience I did. Mm -hmm. Do you still speak with people like in the poker space or the gambling space? Because I can't tell you how many people we have on the show who are like, I started out gambling or playing poker and then I found out about crypto. It seems like it's such a like a, a gateway activity, I guess. Yeah, I, I actually do. Uh, so unbeknownst to a lot of people, investor number one at Blockfolio is Huckleberry Seed, who won the main event of the World Series, I think, in 1993. He's considered one of the greatest like prop bettors in the world. Uh, Huck is a very good friend of mine. Uh, and in fact, I would say uh, a lot of like the early employees at Blockfolio were like, I, I knew them from the professional poker world and brought them over to crypto. Uh, but yeah, but I still, I still keep in touch with uh, like guys, uh, the winner of this year's main event, uh, John Sin, uh, I was out on the rail, it's uh, sweating him in Vegas wearing a Blockfolio shirt. Uh, and you can see it on ESPN uh, because he was, uh, uh, he's also like a close friend. Uh, so I still keep in touch with a lot of those guys. Do you ever talk with them about crypto or whether they're involved or what are their thoughts on it or anything like that? Yeah, we do. We, we talk a lot about, about crypto. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I think, uh, you know, all the poker guys I know though, they kind of came in more on the investment side. Um, right. They're, they're, uh, some of them became traders. Uh, other ones were uh, doing more like hedge fund, crypto hedge fund type investments. Uh, and then, you know, there's some that, I'd say very few of them like kind of went into like building uh, like businesses, I would say. Uh, but yeah, no, we talk, we talk every once in a while kind of about the markets, what, what things are, where they think things are going. Uh, you know, they're high, highly quantitative, highly analytical people, at least mm -hmm. at the professional level, right? Oh, yeah. And I mean, they've gotten kicked in the ball so many times in poker that like when they came into crypto, you know, this, they were like, oh, these swings, you know, whatever. It's, not that it's nothing. Deal, right. <laughs> so. And let's talk about Blockfolio. You know, how did, how did you come about founding, co-founding Blockfolio? Um, once we get to, you know, get through that piece, then let's talk about where you got, where you vision Blockfolio going and how it can help the folks in crypto. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, Blockfolio, um, it started kind of, there's a, uh, my co, there, I have two co-founders at Blockfolio, uh, actually three technically, uh, Charlie Mason, uh, Peter Lau, who's our technical co-founder, and another guy named Ken Feldman. And uh, back in 2000, early 2014, late 2013, I was on, on Bitcoin talk all the time, kind of looking for the next investment that I thought had promise. I mean, that back then it was kind of funny, like these, these projects were trying to raise like $300,000 to launch a protocol, right? Just 
insanely small compared to today's numbers. But in Bitcoin Talk, the forum, I kept running into this, this same guy, which was my co-founder, Charlie Mason. He was on the same on the same threads as I was, like looking at all the same investments. And so one day I was like, I shot him a, a PM a private message. And I was like, hey, dude, uh, do you want to like talk over the phone? Because we're all, you know, it might be more efficient than like, you know, chatting on these forums. Uh, it turned out he lived like two miles away from me in Venice, right? And uh, I'm in Los Angeles and uh, in kind of near LAX. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it was pretty small world, right? I mean, this is like a global forum. And so we got together. We started making a bunch of investments in the crypto space together, kind of doing a lot of research, uh, sharing research. Uh, and then um, another friend of mine who's a big whale on the Bitcoin talk forums named Otto, like his handle is Otto, his name's Richard. And he... Uh, he and I would look at investments together. And one day he showed me this app called Pocket Crypto. And it was just the home screen of Blockfolio. It didn't have charts or order book or alarms, none of the bells and whistles. And uh, I remember looking at it thinking like, you know, Charlie and I had always had these discussions about like the future that we thought there was going to be in blockchain technology, just because, uh, um, you know, we saw that it could alter how databases interacted. And we're like, wow, this is going to like impact every industry on the planet one day. And we knew that private blockchains weren't trustless. So there would be a lot of public blockchain assets that we thought like one day everyone wanted to track prices on. And so when I saw this, this uh, pocket crypto thing where you could just kind of punch in your balance and, you know, just spit out your total portfolio, uh, it was so convenient for me that I was like, wow, I think we can build a business around this, you know, maybe. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. in, in 2014, like there was maybe 150 cryptocurrencies. There was today, I think there's like 10,000. It's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. And so, so I, I brought Charlie on board and there was this guy, Ken Feldman, who was a UX UI designer here in LA. And I said, listen, man, why don't you come over and help us kind of do the, you know, put together this app. And uh, we came up with the name Blockfolio, which is, you know, our choices back then were like coin. Uh, everything was either like uh, coin or block. I think, and we're like, oh, I think, I think things might move over to the tech, more likely to move over to the tech side of things, like blockchain versus like the money side of things. Um, so we we just realized a blockfolio would be a great name, and, uh, and we started building it. We didn't we we uh, start building it in the, um, September, I think, of 2014. Launched in 2015. Uh, Peter, you know, was the kid that had built pocket crypto kind of in his dorm room i reached out to him asked him you know he decided to come on board built all the the first version of, of blockfolio pretty much out of his dorm room to be honest and uh uh and i you know put the deal together originally i was just the deal maker of it and asked charlie to be the ceo and uh and you know in the beginning i just do biz dev and we launched it in 2015 uh, we seeded it with, this is the only money we ever spent on paid user acquisition too, by the way, we spent $300 back in 2015 on it. And, wow. uh, and we, uh, and we were like, all right, let's just build this thing for ourselves. Let's, let's get like, you know, we'll see if we can get a little community together, get some feedback and, and kind of, and we were active investors, right. And traders. So like we were, it was easy for us. It scratched our own itch. Uh, but yeah. And then, and then we launched Blockfolio and, uh, in the beginning, it was funny though, man, because uh, 2014, there are a lot, every all the portfolio tracking apps were Bitcoin only, and uh, oh no, kidding! Yeah, well, I mean, for, there may be like two that had like altcoins, right? But they might have had like ten of the coin other cryptocurrencies. There weren't there there wasn't at the time anybody who had tracked all cryptocurrencies across all exchanges, and so that was kind of like our initial thing. We're like, let's just be the guys that track all cryptocurrencies on all exchanges. And, uh, you know, it's just like when you open the app, the split second you open it, you get to see your portfolio balance. Those, that was like the kind of three things that we wanted to do, right? And then other than the, like the lesser bells and whistles, like, you know, alerts and stuff. Um, and in the beginning, I think back in the day, there was these, uh, these big whales that I would talk to sometimes that were like made a ton of money off Bitcoin. And they were like, literally tell me like, dude, Blockfolio is a stupid idea. <laughs> like they're like, <laughs> nobody, no, Bitcoin's going to be the only one that wins, bro. Uh, like nobody's going to track these other altcoins. They're all going to die. Right. And I was like, no, man, I think like we, me and Charlie used to sit in this living room and be like, 
you know, one day there's going to be 10,000, you know, blockchains that people want to track. Like we really believed it back then. And it was, and it's kind of scary when you're like building something and like, uh, you got people telling you that you're retarded to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so it was sort of felt, uh, like, you know, like you're like Noah and you're like, dude, this big wave's coming. I'm telling you. And like, you're putting all these pairs into your app instead of like into your boat. Uh, and, uh, uh, then when the big wave of interest came in 2017, uh, we were the only professional game in town. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so we picked up uh, a lot of the market share just, uh, you know, and, and, uh, it, it was pretty much a whirlwind. Like we went from 8,000 monthly active users in January of 2017 to 2.2 .2 million monthly active users in Jeez. January, 2017. Dang. And remember, we never, we never spend any money on paid user act. <laughs> so sure. it, like everybody was just like, you got to use block folio. It's, and so yeah, it's one of those uh, apps. what's that? Right. It's like, it's like, as soon as you use it, you're like, how did I not use this earlier? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, it, it was, uh, and in the bull markets, it's super fun too. Like what was, what was interesting is like, it was the, I would, I would compare the experience that people went through similar to like, in a slot machine wheel right oh yeah because the markets are so volatile you know they open it up and they swipe down it's like pulling a slot machine wheel like you have basically your brain probably has the same dopamine release as like when you're at the casino which is kind of uh you know i think it's kind of funny given my gambling background uh, you know and it's it's funny too when you when you talk about that you know during the bulls the bull run we had first thing i did when i woke up in the morning was pull up black folio refresh it check it you know, I'm like, all right, starting my day out, perfect. And now it's just like, ah, shit. Do I even want to open Blockfolio and and peek <laughs> at this? You know, but it's funny too. A lot of people on, you know, Twitter and and people in in the troll box here on on the YouTube link are saying, ask him when uh, why everything in Blockfolio is red. You know, obviously they know you don't really have <laughs> control over it, but it's it's just kind of funny how people associate Blockfolio, you know, with with the markets that. So that's good. That's always good. It's yeah, sort of like, the, like that split second when I like refresh it and like it takes that split second to load is like my heart almost drops nowadays. <laughs> yeah, know? that's like, so true. Just like gonna go down. Like, <laughs> Dude, so I'm telling you, it's just like the casinos, man. It's uh, this crypto market's insane. People want they want to know how their things do. They want the action right away. It's nuts. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and oftentimes like it's kind of weird because you forget that it's you know you, people get so fixated on the price they forget it's really about this like technology that is actually going to be really transformative on society, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that's, uh, uh, so as, as we started getting this big user base, like, you know, I'd already been like trying to contribute to protocols very early on, which is how I ended up at, at, at on the dash foundation. Uh, and so as we got this huge user base, we realized we had this real platform to kind of like deliver something that was going to be valuable to the ecosystem, which, you know, we can talk about which eventually became block folio signal. Um, you know, but, uh, um, yeah, I don't know if you want to go into that or kind of, yeah, let's talk oh. about signal. Cause that's a very new aspect of the yeah. app, right. Or not very, but like as of a few months, I believe. Yeah. So we launched, uh, Blockfolio signal back in, um, what was it in May of this year? Right. And so it was like, let me see here. It was a, it's probably like. Like I had the idea for Signal probably in August, maybe even like July of last year, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I realized we were just getting this massive reach. And, and again, it was like one of these things that we were scratching our own itch where we're, I, we were so busy building Blockfolio. And we were like, you know what, man, it'd be really awesome if we could like, instead of having to go to 10 different like Telegram channels to track our investments, like all the news that's coming out or like get on Twitter and get, you know, pitch fake giveaways. Um, if I could just, we could get that information directly to us and it was like in a feed and personalized based on what we hold in our portfolio. Right. And, uh, and so kind of at the end of the year, maybe December, we were at a bit of a crossroads cause we had all these users. We just raised uh, like $3 million also, uh, kind of mostly around just the growth that we had. That's and, uh, uh, and our users were asking for uh, exchange integration and wallet monitoring, right? Which is, uh, which is, uh, 
you know, convenient for like the advanced, you know, cryptocurrency enthusiasts that's trading all the time. They don't want to have to manually input, you know, yeah. a ton of trades in the portfolio. Uh, but I kept thinking about it. I'm like, you know, the problem with this is that it's only going to service like a small percentage of our users, like the power users. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and right now this mainstream of interest that came into the market, like they hardly understand how to use wallets. Like how are they going to understand how to like, you know, link their trading accounts and their API keys. Right. And, uh, and so then I thought about it. I was like, you know, the signal thing is actually a pretty decent idea because like everybody wants information, whether you're a newbie to the ecosystem or where you're like, whether you've been in it for a long time, or even if you're like actively trading or you're a buy and hold guy, you want to find out about like relevant information about these investments that you make. And there's no better source for that than the projects themselves. Right. Oh yeah. So, uh, so, and then we, we started kind of specking it out. And, and so we built it and we launched it uh, and uh, we launched it in May and we had, uh, I think like 25 teams originally in the beta. We had uh, uh, kind of these high impact teams, uh, you know, Monero, Zcash, Decred, Quantstam, Icon, uh, you know, we, we started kind of with them and the idea was we wanted to do a really limited release in the beginning just to test it out and make sure that like, People actually like this thing but also at the same time we didn't want to like open the floodgates to everyone um so we were worried that like you know some of these like i mean as much as it sucks they're like shady ico projects that you know we felt were going to be shilling to our user base and we wanted to protect our user base from kind of the unnecessary marketing hype the, and, there's uh, no shilly user or ico still around <laughs> <laughs> right uh kidding uh, so, uh, uh, so what we, what we realized, uh, is, uh, you know, let's start at limited, uh, just like, you know, usually the culture of a company is defined by like the often, you know, it's mostly defined by the first, the personality of the first five people of the company. We felt like, oh, we want to create this product culture that is really about like technical advancements and like have high level team leadership that delivers those announcements. And, and, and maybe this product culture can be defined by like the early, uh, uh, participants in the beta program. And then they could set the examples how the later, uh, the later, uh, uh, projects that we brought on board would behave. And it actually worked out great. I mean, like now we have, we have over 165, uh, teams now broadcasting, nice. uh, We've never had any complaints about like, you know, marketing hype or shilling. Um, we probably have like another 150 maybe left or 200 on the wait list um, to get on. So it's been pretty well received. Uh, but I, what I think is great is that, uh, is that to me, it was like what I'd hoped it'd be. Like I get like valuable info. I don't have to go to other places and, uh, and it comes directly from the teams. But one of the other awesome things about it is like we've really gotten to know a lot of these teams and uh, develop relationships with them, which is kind of exciting. Yeah, for sure. Um, question I wanted to ask quick, uh, not related to Signal, but somebody asked this in the chat, which I thought was an interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about or are there any plans to perhaps integrate tax calculations within Blockfolio? I know that probably opens up a can of worms, but... Yeah, um, so, I mean, we've, we've kind of had this vision of like where we want to rest in the ecosystem, you know? we really kind of want to be a connector right and we want to kind of like we, we when we built signal it kind of like took us from being just an app and connecting like speculators with exchange information to being like an actual network and getting like these token projects and kind of our our apprehension to doing tax services right now is kind of similar to our apprehension to doing like uh, uh transactions through the app where we generate fees right we uh we, we know that we want to kind of be at the center of this kind of uh, space, delivering data and information. And I kind of feel like when you start charging the users, it really changes the narrative. You know, you start being seen totally yeah. differently as, as an entity, you know, it's funny, man, because like that was always my, like the reason why we didn't want to charge. And then like, we don't charge and people all of a sudden like think that they're the product too. Right. And so, uh, uh, so it's like, you can't win either way, but, uh, yeah, um, people always find something to complain about. Yep. And so, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of like why we stayed away from charging for anything. Like we have awesome investors that kind of believe in our vision 
uh, uh, kind of where we want to position ourselves, um, who are totally fine with us. Like I was pretty adamant. I was like, look, we're going to focus on growth and network effects and, and, not, and we're going to push monetization down later. And even if we do eventually to figure out how to where, where and how we specifically want to monetize, like I don't really want it coming from the end users. I'd rather charge like token projects. Maybe if we find something that's massively valuable for them, right? Um, uh, I kind of prefer that way. Like you know, it's always more. It, you feel better when you charge businesses over charging people. <laughs> yeah, totally. We we had very similar conversations when we were talking about the podcast. You know, because there are a number of ways we could do subscriptions. We could do advertisements, and we always had the same exact reservation in terms of charging people directly. I think it just. You know, it, and one of our goals too with this was like just increase adoption of crypto to people. You know, I spread the word, spread news about interesting projects, and I think anything that prohibits that kind of is counter um, to our overall goals of increasing adoption of this. You know, which is obviously self-serving, but um, I think it's a good thing for society too. So I, I would imagine that played a role in that strategy as well. Yeah, I mean, we 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 actually ran three ads in the in the. In the in the portfolios, uh, one was for Status back in June of 2017. One was for uh, Quantstamp in October, and one was for Lendroid in February of this year. And I mean, we did so much due diligence trying to make sure that we felt like they were high quality projects, right? Uh, and and once we did that Status one, like the floodgates opened. We probably had, oh my god, like over the course of the next year, we probably had 200 ICO projects pitched us trying to get. You know, access to our user base, right? They want to put these ads and ICO ads in front of them, uh, and we basically this is a crazy stat, but like it's for real. It's not an exaggeration. We in that in that year period, we probably turned away twenty million dollars worth of revenue. We didn't end up making you know decent money from those three ads, but we were like, we we just and and we just knew that we you know we knew we wanted to build a very trusted platform. And how can you build a trusted platform if you're showing these crappy ICOs? Right. Yeah. So, um, and then when the SEC came out and they were like, you know, hey, all we see all tokens as securities, we're like, all right, maybe we should like reconsider this. You know, even the high quality projects, like, I just we're just better off just figuring out a different way to monetize. Uh, you know, that was that was just really good. Like, that was a that was probably the beginning of the end there. Going straight into. I'm this always interested. So you guys really launched in, in 2015, correct? Uh-huh. So this most recent period, let's say the past 11 months or so of 2018, that's the first like big bearish period we've, all of us, you know, speaking for me, Dale, and I think yourself at least as, you know, the, the head of Blockfolio, um, as the first like big bearish period we've gone through. So how has that been different? How has it affected maybe the mood of, of people participating in the project at all? Um, we just see so much negativity and, and we fall into it all the time as well. Um, and it, it can be a little bit difficult to stay positive sometimes. Um, you know what's kind of nice? I mean, like the fact that I've been in this space since 2013 and went through that 2015 bear market, I can kind of saw how bad it was, you know, we saw a lot of companies shake out and, and kind of, we just knew like when we launched Blockfolio, we were in like middle of that bear market. And uh, my, my co-founders and I knew we had to like be super frugal. We didn't know how long the bear market was going to last. And so uh, we just had, I was fortunate I had a co-founder that was, uh, um, had like had a startup that didn't succeed that ran out of runway before. So we were like all super like uh, uh, paranoid about, about running out of runway. And so uh, 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 kind of this bear market's the same. It's just like, you got to tighten up the purse strings, right? It's, What's interesting to me about this bear market is that it's like if you overlay the 2013 hype cycle of Bitcoin crypto like on top of this one today, it's surprisingly close how it, it you know how it traces you know the 2013 down cycle, right? And uh, and so I kind of like remind people at least in the company like it's just like you know it's, it's all going to turn eventually. This technology is like transformative. Uh, you know, there's going to be some other killer use case that's discovered that evidences that the technology delivers more value post blockchain than pre blockchain. And eventually everybody will like pile in a bunch of money again, I guess, and get all excited, but it's going to be a while before that gets uncovered. And so uh, kind of like reminding 
you know, forgetting about price and remembering about the tech is a way to kind of keep a little bit of an even keel, I think, you know? And then these bear markets is like when, you know, you get rid of all the businessmen and it begin, it goes back to the builders, you know, which is kind of nice. Well, and you guys are positioned in a good place too, where it's, I mean, it's not like a project, you know, where you raised like 10 million and you thought it was going to go to a hundred million, you know, now you have to pay devs, you have to pay for office space, you have to pay for materials, internet, all that stuff that goes with the business. You guys are positioned in a place where, you know, if, if anything survives at all, no matter what it is in terms of individual projects, you benefit from that because, um, you know, obviously you're a service where you don't really rely on, on a certain project doing well, just that the overall space stays alive. Yeah, I mean, we're sort of like a bet on the ecosystem, which yeah. sort of like, you know, we realized, like I said, I mean, I was always super passionate about the tech. And it's really cool to kind of wake up one day and realize, like, you know, you have this important platform that's got millions of users and like, you can actually do a lot to help the ecosystem. I think Signal kind of represents that, right? Signal brings proximity between the token projects and the speculators, their token base, right? And, and that's... And that's, uh, I think that's a really important thing because, I mean, right now what everybody is look, I, you know, I'm, I don't I mean this, like I think what people are looking for is they're trying to figure out how do we get this ecosystem away from just speculating on price to actually utilizing these protocols, right? And, and I think a communication layer is going to be really important in that and just discovering what it is that, that is that, that killer use case that, you know, uh, there's a lot of benefits from like, uh, you know, having having a, a very direct communication channel with your users. So it's not like, you know, you're you're pulling people on or you know asking people questions on Reddit or on Twitter where you don't even know if they hold your tokens. Now it's like, you know, you're, you get, these token teams get to talk directly to the people who uh, who are invested in their projects. And I think uh, that we're going to see some interesting. Uh, uh, things brought out from that. I mean, we're doing a lot of uh, a lot of talking to token projects and kind of figuring out how we can service the needs of them and their their token economies. And so we got a lot of ideas, kind of where we can take this that might be beneficial for the ecosystem. Have you ever was there ever a point during the bear markets you've experienced where you really started to doubt the tech? Because I think that's where a lot of people are right now. You know, they're, it's easy to sell yourself on the tech when everything is going up twenty percent per week for like a year straight. Um, yeah. it, you kind of get this mindset of how could this not succeed, but it's different now, I think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, I think by those kind of emotions, I put them behind me back in like 2015. Right. But I mean, like I said, I'm kind of a dinosaur in this space. I'm, I haven't been around here since 2012. Uh, so I understand, you know, like this is the first down cycle, this, the, the new entrance into the market that came in in 2017 are experiencing. Right. And uh, 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 I, I, the only thing I can say is like, uh, we've, I've seen it, you know, 2015 and I kind of saw the tail end of it when I started first observing in 2012. Uh, and, uh, you know, it seems to be cyclic. And uh, the other thing too, is that what's interesting to me is uh, there are a lot of developers coming to the space. Actually, so you know what, let me tell you this, there, there are a couple of things that that clear indicators to me that something's different this time around than 2015. In 2015, like protocols would like evaporate overnight and exchanges would evaporate overnight, right? It was definitely the wild west. But like now you got these like really smart guys that are like leaving jobs at Google and Apple and, you know, top tier companies to get into the, the crypto, uh, to the blockchain space. And that wasn't like that back then. In, 2000, in 2014, like, I remember when we were working at Dash, like, you know, if you program your parents' website, we're like, hey, you want to help out? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and and today, you know, like this is this will give you an indication. Like we put up a job posting uh, a little while back for an operations manager at Blockfolio. We had three Harvard MBAs apply. That wow. blew my mind. Right. That's awesome. And, and you know what's even funnier? We didn't hire any of them. Right. Like we, we, and most two of them, it was because, you know, they didn't have enough time in the blockchain space. Like I'm really looking for guys that have been in the space and believe in the tech been through at least, at least for two years. Right. And then the, the one that was very knowledgeable about the tech and everything just wasn't invested in crypto. And for some reason that just like made me feel like his heart wasn't there. Right. And, uh, 
And so we ended up getting hired this other guy who, uh, who worked, he was senior director of operation at Garrett Camp, the Uber founders incubator. And uh, he left there and had the choice between going to be director of operations at Nike Innovation Labs or coming with us. And I couldn't believe he joined with us, which also puts a lot of pressure on you, you know, so. Let's talk about um, kind of maybe shift gears here a little bit and talk about your time on, you know, the Dash Foundation. What, uh, you know, what's that all entailed? Maybe why you got on and just kind of dive into that a little bit. Yeah. So remember in 2014, I was like on Bitcoin talk looking for all these like, you know, I was looking for things that would were beyond Bitcoin, like uh, mm -hmm. new use cases, blockchain. Sure. And so we started and I saw it. That one sprouted up that came on my radar was called Darkcoin, right? And and in early 2014, there were like whispers of regulation of bit license on the horizon, you know? So I sort of had this like feeling that like, uh, you know, uh, this was going to piss off a lot of the early libertarian Bitcoin adopters. And, uh, and they might be looking for anon cryptocurrencies to invest in, right? And so I was like, oh, wow, it makes sense to like, you know, this dad, that used to be called Darkcoin, right? And so I got like five of my friends, Huck Seed was one of them, a couple other uh, poker players or investors. And, uh, and uh, we bought a lot of dark coin. And so we started kind of like treating like a VC. We're like, well, we believe in this. And at the time, Bitcoin had organically had about $500 million in venture money that was, you know, made it into the market, into, into the ecosystem to build out the infrastructure, like free to use wallets, mobile apps, uh, mobile wallets, things like that. And so if Dash was going to compete as a cryptocurrency, uh, you know, it needed a lot of work done as far as like infrastructure of the ecosystem, right? And uh, it needed a lot of capital to come in. And, and so um, we were toying around with different ideas. One of them was like, we had a lot of this. We're like, why don't we start an incubator? Kind of like what Consensus did with Ethereum we were going to call it protoculture, right? And uh, mm. it's like a dark coin only incubator. Like we'll fund anything dark coin related. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, then also, you know, I think I knew John Carlo up in Finex and I, uh, uh, we have kind of a, a, a loose acquaintanceship and uh, reached out to him and, and uh, you know, I was like, hey dude, you know, I think this, this and on cryptocurrency stuff, it's going to be interesting. So they decided to list Darkcoin uh, on Bitfinex, and then uh, and then I reached out to the core developer Evan uh, after I'd like kind of made some contributions behind the scenes, and I was like, "Hey, dude, uh, I want to figure out how to like help you guys out. Um, you know, is there anything you need?" And I guess because what I'd done with getting Darkcoin listed on Bitfinex, uh, he took it serious. I was like, "Yeah, man, like uh, you know, we we need developers, <laughs> you know." And I was like, "All right, well, let's start. Like, maybe we can start a foundation." Uh, and, um, you know, kind of naively thinking that people would donate a bunch of money and we could hire developers for that. Right. And we, we started up a foundation and, and it got very little capital, uh, very little contributions, not, well, not enough to kind of like support what they needed. And, uh, uh, you know, so remember how we were trying to kind of maybe do an incubator called protoculture. Well, the, the major holder of it, his name is Richard Anderson. And he was like, man, it's, it's basically me that's going to be funding a lot of these free to use apps and all the other token holders are going to benefit from this, <laughs> you know, except for our, it, it's, 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 a, it's an unfair distribution of the risk, right? He's like, so I'm not really too enthusiastic about this uh, incubator. And so, uh, and I'd already had a relationship with, uh, with Evan and, uh, um, you know, I guess kind of got a little sidetracked and digressed. Sometimes I lose my train of thought, but like in this process, uh, you know, basically uh, Evan, Evan and I, uh, or I proposed him to start up the foundation. That's how the foundation started. We wanted to get money to help build out the ecosystem to get developers, right? And uh, that's how I ended up in one of the founding board members of the Dash Foundation. Uh, nice. But as it continued, like I kept, uh, you know, beyond just the foundation, we were just trying to figure out how to build out this ecosystem. It was a whole lot of fun back then because it was just like, you know, a dozen people trying to figure out how to, you know, make this thing work. And so eventually 
I guess where I was going with this is uh, eventually we, you know, on the board level at Dash, I ended up helping out a lot with a lot of contributions on the uh, kind of behind the scenes, uh, you know, helping co-originate their idea of uh, uh, the idea of uh, governance and treasury, uh, just sort of this venture arm out of like mining rewards. Anyway, sorry about rambling. Just... No, that's that's perfectly fine. Oh, kind of gives more background to it. So, Ed, we're going to hit you with a heavy hit hitting question for the last one of the night. So I hope you're ready. Sure, man. All right. In like a 30 second to a minute elevator speech, why should cryptocurrency users, holders use Blockfolio over the, you know, biggest competitors? Um, I think because, uh, you know, ever since the beginning, like kind of where, what we do with Blockfolio has really been about like, advancing the ecosystem. It's been very user first and uh, uh, ecosystem first, our approach and the innovations, the things that we create. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, uh, I think, um, you know, I would say use it because you like it. <laughs> we we <laughs> really try to put, we really try to put a lot of thought into uh, the features and functionalities that we put in there for everyone. We're not trying to kind of like, uh, blow it out and have like, you know, a bunch of bells and whistles in it. We want, really want to do stuff that's like, uh, you know, valuable. Uh, but we're also trying to create an app that's like really more towards, geared towards the mainstream and is actually going to connect everybody in the ecosystem versus, uh, you know, something I might just service like a small percentage of our users. So, I mean, my, the main reason why is like, dude, if you like the experience, uh, please use the app. Uh, and we're going to do everything we can on our side to like deliver a valuable experience to you guys. That's great. Um, I use the I use the app, and actually, as a matter of fact, my my mother uses it as well. So, you know, I like what you guys have going on. Uh, <laughs> it's really great. Yeah, for my so, sixty year old mother to to you use contrib the, you uh, contribute to your mother shit coining. <laughs> she just basically does whatever <laughs> I tell her. So, um, so yeah, that everyone that's Edmund. Kata, he is a CEO, co-founder of Blockfolio, and also sits on the Dash Foundation board. So, Ed, thank you very much for your time. It was uh, very knowledgeable. Great insights to you know Blockfolio, what you guys have going on. Um, yeah, it's, uh, sorry about the rambling, man. It's been a long day for me over no, here. No, it's, it's great. Hey, well, you know, it gives a lot this. of the background. Yeah, and I it's do. a podcast. The point is to talk too. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. it's uh, it don't feel bad. It you did great. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks so much for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Good. I'm glad. Uh, you know, keep doing what you guys are doing at Block Photo. A lot of people like it. We, I do. Um, I can't speak for the, for Killer Prince, but uh, thanks Love everyone it. for listening. Make sure you guys, you know, like us on on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, follow Crypto Street Podcast, subscribe on iTunes, all that good stuff. Tip your waitress, hootskies, have some for the boys. Stay safe. Get this get this bull market back going, everybody. We appreciate you listening. Take care. We'll chat with you guys later. Bye, guys.